Hi guys, and welcome again to the Q&A here with FKK. Um, we are in chapter six, if I'm not mistaken. And this time we're gonna have uh, D2 coaches that will be able to answer our questions. Very happy because I was able to um, communicate with some quality coaches that will be able to join us today and we'll be able to answer the questions that we have. So um, with further ado, I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about themselves on their program. Um, Aaron, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, my name is Erin Barsaw. I'm the assistant women's soccer coach at Lees McRae College. We're located in the mountains of North Carolina in Banner Elk. Um, We're a Division II school competing in Conference Carolinas. Uh, John? I'm John Husak. I'm the head coach at uh, Texas A&M International University down in Laredo, Texas. Um, we're a Division II program in the Lone Star Conference. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a brand new program and excited to be there. Yes. So I've been working with both of you guys for a little bit. Um, what what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of ask your opinion about the FKK staff, the FKK teams, their membership. Um, I know that um, I shared a, a couple times um, some communication between you know you guys. Um, so I wanted to hear your opinion a little bit about what we're doing and and the way we're trying to help our our, our membership to get recruited. Uh, John, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I mean, you know, F FKK has been kind of a target for the schools that, that I've kind of coached at in the past. And even even now today, you know, like, like we were talking about earlier with some kids that we're trying to get over to come for a visit. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, with, with the staff you guys have and what, what Hugh's set up there and, and from the top – top to bottom from your top teams to your second teams to your third teams to however many teams you guys have at whatever age. Um, there are quality kids kind of throughout and that's kind of reassuring for us as coaches uh, to be able to kind of have that much uh, to pick from. Um, so that's, that's why we kind of go back to, to FKK because it's kind of like that uh, the proverbial money tree almost, right? Like you would just want to keep picking from it if it's still producing fruit. So, um, you know, we, we, we've always targeted FKK and, and what the staff does there is, is great from, you know, the coaches to the individual sessions with the goalkeepers and things like that. Um, you know, we've, we've always, we've always seen it as, as a quality club to find players from, and you can see what the, where you're sending your, where you're sending your players. So, um, it kind of speaks for itself in that sense as well. Uh, Aaron, I know that we've been um, talking a little bit in the, this past few few weeks and obviously a few months. Um, you came to our events. Um, you came to the December event, and that's where we kind of started talking a little bit. Can you give me a little bit of your opinion about our approach and how aggressive we are as far as recruiting um, for, our, for, for our memberships in, in general? Yeah, absolutely. So for us, FKK, regardless, even before December, you know, we would see any Florida Craze Crush team on, you know, the, the recruiting schedule and we would make sure that they, they made our schedule, whether um, a recruit had contacted us from one of the teams or, you know, the name is very reputable. Um, obviously, we're all the way from North Carolina and, you know, a lot of Florida clubs are all right. But FKK is definitely one of those top clubs that we want to make sure that we're seeing from every level, as John was saying, um, you know, from your top ECNL teams all the way through. Um, we can find players that that always turn our heads and have great, great characteristics there. Um, and that obviously goes back to the coaching, you know, the club culture and language that you guys have created have just created more tactically aware players, more technically sound. So that the time that they get to us, it's just easier for us to work with them and have them make a bigger impact in our program. That's good to hear. So let's talk about uh, some questions that we receive. And obviously, I'm going to shoot the questions and pick your brains a little bit. Uh, John, can you talk a little bit about um, the difference between D1, D2, D3, and NAIA um, and a JUCO? Um, as far as uh, maybe touch a little bit about maybe the rules, uh, maybe finances, uh, what are a little bit of the difference that you um, can point out? Yeah, I mean, it, from a recruiting standpoint, you know, Division One is obviously has has the the most strict guidelines in terms of when they can contact and when you can come on campus and when they can can speak with you officially. I know they have that; they've had a lot of rule changes as of late. 
where uh, even if you come on as an unofficial visitor, you're walking through campus, they can't even talk to you until you're a junior and things like that. So, um, you know, they, they have the opportunity or the, the ability to offer more scholarship than the Division II program can at, at the max amount. I'm not saying that's uh, consistent throughout because every program is funded differently. Um, but they have that ability to be at the max of 14 scholarships per uh, per program. Um, you know, at, from a Division II standpoint, um, you know, we have the advantage of, of being able to bring players in to actually try them out and train them. Uh, whereas at Division I, they, they actually don't have that ability to do that. Um, you know, we're, we're funded a bit less with the maximum amount of scholarship money being 9.9 .9, uh, scholarships per program. And again, that funding is not consistent throughout the programs in the country. So um, that's kind of the major difference there. You know, we still have the same kind of contact rules. Your, your summer of your junior year, we're allowed to speak with you and you're allowed to come on campus. But if you do come on campus unofficially, we can talk to you uh, for now. If that rule changes, we don't know. But for now, it's, it's still, you know, if you do come on and you're a sophomore and we, we run into you or you run into us, we can speak with you and things like that. Uh, Division three and AIA is a little more relaxed in terms of recruiting. You know, they can contact you pretty much at any point. Um, uh, Division three has the ability to, you know, offer you positions on teams at any point as well. So, um, you know, they're, they're again, they're merit-based. Uh, they don't have the scholarship available, but typically Division three schools are very, very academic schools um, and can be very, very good teams as well. So uh, you have, you know, you sacrifice, you know, athletic scholarship for a, a very good education in some, in some cases. And, uh, and then even NAI schools, I know they've got scholarship and uh, they've got, you know, maximum amounts and, and things like that. And they're all funded differently. But, um, you know, at that point, you know, then you go down to JUCO, which, you know, I, I don't even like using the word down to JUCO because there's a lot of very good JUCO coaches and teams out there that could probably, you know, walk over a, a Division II team, potentially a Division One team, you know. So don't rule out a junior college in, in the recruiting process because, you know, they have the scholarship money. A lot of them are funded very, very well. A lot of them are, are able to bring in, you know, players and, and put quality teams together and get you started on the right education path and things like that. Um, so, you know, junior college contact rules, I think it's pretty open. It's very similar to NAIA and D3 where they can um, speak to you at any point. And, uh, you know, if that's something that you're interested in as well, I mean, junior college is a fantastic route for anybody. I mean, just again, even in even in the state of Florida, with with the five teams you've got you've got there with both Daytona, Eastern, ASA, and and Brow or Broward, so um, it's just you know you've got some of the best junior colleges in the country just in one state, and there's only five of them, so. Um, you know, that, that's a, a good option as well, so. Okay, um, Aaron, why don't you talk to us a little bit about scholarships? Like what are the difference in between the programs as far as scholarships? Yeah, so John kind of touched a, a bit about it with um, Division One fully funded is gonna be 14 full scholarships. And for Division Two fully funded is 9.9. .9. So with that, any school that's Division Two or any school that's Division One can fall anywhere in that spectrum of one through 14. Um, and same thing for division two, one all the way up to 9.9. .9. So it really just comes down to the in institutional funding um, and sometimes like conference allotments as well. Sometimes there's, there's a certain cap on them per conference and then overall the institution then divvies out how much scholarship each team has for each program. Um, and then on division three, it is all academic based merit. So with Division I and Division II, you can stack your academic with your athletic aid. And Division Three, you only have the academic aid then with no athletic. And same thing for um, NAIA, it goes back to Division I, Division II rules with having academic and athletic scholarship money 
as well as JUCO. You can have academic and athletic as well. Yeah, that answered a lot of questions for some of the, some of the girls that were asking about that. Um, Erin, can you explain to us a little bit about if the recruiting process is different, um, meaning D1, D2, D3 versus NAIA or uh, JUCO? Um, does the recruiting process, as a, your, your point of view as a coach, is it that, do you feel that is any different? Not necessarily. Um, at the end of the day, it's still a lot of the same standard procedures. With that, we do have a couple more rules and restrictions than an AIA or JUCO might have. Um, you know, with that June 15 restriction of not being able to speak to you preceding your junior year. Um, so any 2022 right now, you know, have been, been waiting for that date and been circling it for a while. Um, so that restriction, sometimes those 2022s have already decided to go to an NAIA by the time that we're even legally allowed to, allowed to directly contact you. Um, so with that, that recruiting process itself isn't very different, but at the same time, some of the legislation that's in place, there are some advantages amongst the different levels. Okay. Um, Jen, can you explain to us about, or actually, what, what is the process that you're going through right now? Um, for recruiting uh, with this with this issue that we're dealing with with coronavirus, um, are you getting a lot of emails? Do you prefer uh, players to send you film? Um, what is your recruiting process in this in this crisis? Yeah, I mean it's it's obviously it, it's kind of thrown a a wrench in the wheel, so to speak. I mean, you know, especially taking over a, a new like taking over this program as the new head coach and things like that, um, but you know, for the most part, yeah, we've seen heavy emails with, with a lot of film or, you know, people that are just kind of panicked that, you know, they were hoping for that last showcase tournament and, and they weren't able to get to it. And, you know, we had players lined up that we were going to see and, you know, maybe they didn't have film or they, they weren't able to get film together. So now they're, you know, you see the emails where they, they're just begging for a, a, they're begging for a spot on the team and things like that because it's this has just thrown everybody for a, a really weird lo a loop. But you know we've we've managed pretty well. We've been able to um, watch a lot of film and and the biggest thing now is since we're not able to go out and, and either a have you come and train with us or b watch you at a tournament or you know go and watch you train or whatever it is. Um, on top of your highlight film, we want to absolutely see i mean i would I, I speak for a lot of coaches but if if we want to try to recruit from 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 film which is not always the best way to recruit but you got to do what you got to do in these times right so uh we also want to look at full game film um it's it's very important because you know we show up to a live game and we get to see your mistakes we get to see your uh, your attitude and how you carry yourself on the field and not just, you know, eight second clips of what's going on. So, um, you know, getting a chance to, to get that full film is going to give us that ability to kind of look at it a little bit more. And, you know, with, with the things restricted so much for us in terms of, you know, being able to not do face-to-face -face recruiting or go out or, you know, our kids aren't on campus or, you know, campuses are closed we have to we have a little more free time to do that in the work day to actually sit and watch a full game so things that we might not be able to do in the past where we just try to knock out in a weekend at a tournament so um yeah i mean you've we've got to adapt as coaches the players have to adapt as players and um you know keep trying keep pushing for those for the programs you want to get into um you know don't don't be discouraged but you know explore your options from from you know if you've targeted a division two school and maybe you can't because you know they just haven't been able to see you play look at junior college look at naia look at division three because they also need players and if you want to go back into the recruiting cycle junior college is a good option um you know go there for a year or two and and just continue in the soccer and get your studies solidified and and uh and then go pop back out in in a year or two depending on on how you want to do it so um 
you know, or, or, I mean, you hear a lot of players nowadays that they just want to take their gap year and play club soccer again, one more year. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see what the, uh, what the landscape's going to look like in the After fall yeah. or whenever we start back up. Right. So you might have graduated seniors playing club that are still recruitable. So it, it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen there. Okay, um, so I'm gonna continue with some of the questions that we have received. So let me explain this question. Uh, the question is actually is, um, what does it take for a player to be recruited? So for for example, if the player is not a ECNL level, you guys are D2 and kind of a high end of a recruiting process for some of our players. What do you feel it takes for a player to be recruited if that player doesn't play ECNL? Um, Aaron, will you wanna give us your input on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so definitely reach out to us. Um, the more that you're in our email and as we're attending a showcase event, you know, we're going to, if you email us, we are going to do our absolute best to see you play. Um, one other respect and two, you know, you've taken enough time to research us. You've looked into our college, our programs of study, personalize those emails. Uh, we get so many emails where there's, you know, little um, mistakes in there, right? It's the wrong college. It's the wrong name. So that when it's done properly, it just really shows um, your attention to detail and how much you care. And then once you're out on the field, we're not just looking for you to put in smashing tackles and score a bunch of goals. There's a lot else in your game that we're looking for. For instance, alone in your work rate, how are you recovering to get to the ball? In the attack, how are you getting forward? Are you looking to find different pockets of space and exploiting different gaps or are you just kind of sitting behind the play and just jogging up along the field? Um, how aggressive are you being? Your overall competitiveness? Are you getting up for 50-50s? Are you kind of shying away from tackles? You know, we're looking at so many different aspects of your game physically, but also mentally. Um, we're looking at your different mental attributes. How are you speaking to your teammates? Are you effectively communicating with them? Um, your overall confidence, how you're responding to a poor referee call or the other team scoring a goal or even your own team scoring a goal. There's a lot that we're looking at outside of just you playing soccer. Um, so we're looking at how you carry yourself, the way you're warming up, how you're speaking to mom in the parking lot. We are looking at you know the entire spectrum of it to see how you can fit into our program. Um, so first and foremost, reach out to us too. If you can introduce yourself to us, you know, we have to be pretty limited in how much we can speak, but so many players just walk by and, you know, kind of walk straight through, but smile, you know, say hello. Um, we can say hello back and that's about as far as we can go usually at a, on a recruiting weekend, but still just making yourself personable. Um, having recruiting flyers out and having a parent pass those out is always very helpful. Um, and then sending a follow-up email as well. If you email me that night or right after the showcase, you know, I've made notes during that game. Now you're holding me accountable to make sure that I'm going back and reaching back out to you in addition to me just sending that email later on that week. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can do to make yourself more marketable to us. Um, and it can be as simple as a smile and a hello. And then overall, your desire to be out on the field and the desire to be the best um, will definitely turn our head. Uh, I like the details, Aaron. I really like the details. Um, and some some of us, you know, pay attention to those details. So I really like. I really love that. Um, Jonah, what age um, are you starting to be recruited? So, at what age do you feel that the player should be actually aggressive um, in the recruiting process? Um, well, I, I think I think it varies, obviously, from division to division. Um, you're going to see a lot of the big time Division One schools. They're gonna they're gonna start at you when you're 13, you're 14. So if if you know you you want to start targeting those schools, start looking at them right right away, right right as you maybe hit your freshman year, or maybe right before you hop into your high school um, years. But you know. Typically, a lot of, of the smaller Division One schools, Division Two schools, don't don't recruit that that far ahead. Um, usually, you know, that I'd say the average is probably about a year ahead, for the most part. And then, you know, from experience looking at junior college and, and things like that, um, you're you're looking at you know that year. So, 
if it's a, if it's 2020, typically junior colleges are, are focused on 2020. They're not looking at 21 or 22. Um, you know, my, my experience talking to a lot of division three coaches as well. Um, they, they kind of do that as well. They don't, they don't look to lock down too far ahead of time. Um, they look to, to commit players, you know, for the year that's coming up. Um, but you know, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to to really focus on on college soccer if that's where you want to end up so you know i may show up to a a 2021 game and walk by a 2022 game and see a 2022 player that's like oh okay i that that player is carrying themselves properly or maybe it's just their warm up and they're warming up very well or um you know they've done something well in the game you know, if, if you're serious about trying to get into college soccer, start acting like you're serious right away as soon as you want to be there because there's always somebody watching, um, whether it's a warm-up, whether it's at the end of a game, whether it's in the middle of the game, whether it's at halftime, people are always there. People are always watching. Um, you know, I know from experience, sometimes you don't even know we're there. Um, you know, Sometimes we're, we blend in with the parents. Sometimes we're dressed like the parents sometimes. So um, you just never know. Um, so if you're serious about it, you know, typically enjoy soccer. But if you want to get into college soccer, start carrying yourself like you're going to be a college athlete and, and really make sure that you're, you're taking the steps and doing the right things on and off the field. Now, um, John, I know you, you work with uh, men's on the men's side. Can you give us a little bit about that as well? Like, do you, do you feel like in the men's side, the recruiting part of the process as far as the age goes is the same? Or do you feel that it's a little bit later? Yeah, my, my brief experience here, just, you know, giving our programs are pretty, pretty tight in that sense here. Uh, we, are, we have our, our separation in terms of, you know, the head coaches are separate, but we, we coordinate a lot on, on different things and, and we take advantage of, of us being out on the recruiting trail and hey there's a kid in Florida I need you to go and see and and I'm more than happy to go and look for for Claudio on the men's side so um yeah I think it's it's fairly similar in the sense of you know I've been he's been close with me on my recruiting talks I've been close with him on his recruiting talks and it all seems to be pretty similar in the sense of you know um without talking to speaking too much about the program and things like that it, it seems like you know men's and women's soccer seem to seem to align in terms of the recruiting process i'm sure you know the indianas of the world on the men's side are are looking four years ahead of 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 us so sure. um i think that's just the nature of the beast but you know if if i was to speak to it a little bit in my experience with the men's side i think it's pretty similar from from what the women are looking at to what the men are looking at. Makes sense. Um, Aaron, how about this one? I think this one is pretty good. Um, how do I know what division can I play at? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I like that one and I saw it earlier. I think first and foremost, if you're watching soccer, that will really help. If you're regularly watching division two, II, division one, division three soccer, we all live stream our games. Um, not some schools do put like a password protection on it and different things, but for the most part, you can log on, watch a game, see if you fit into that system of play that that school is playing. And then to be really self-aware of where you are and if you can see yourself making an impact on that program, or if you'd rather just be a practice player for two years and develop into being that impact player. Um, so really just being self-aware asking your club coaches, asking college coaches. Um, a lot of us coach ODP, a lot of us coach club teams. Um, as John was just saying, sometimes you don't know that we're there. I'll be coaching my club team, but I'm watching the girls on, on the opposite team as well. Um, and, you know, kind of secretly recruiting them as I'm going, I'm going to sort you a number and, and speak to your coach after if you um, show something not that I like. Um, so with that really, knowing where you fall, getting proper feedback from not just your own club coach or your parents, but the other coaches as well will help. Um, and then I think too, ID camps are really important in that. Going to an ID camp, seeing other prospective student athletes that they're recruiting, seeing how you align with those players 
and usually the current players at least hop in for a demo or um, you'll get to see them play at some point to some capacity during the day. Um, and then just seeing how you can fit into that program and your overall impact that you can make in that program is really important. Um, those are some of my favorite ways to see how you can fit in. Um, and I think feedback's really important as well. Okay, so these two questions are kind of kind of together. John, I'll, I'll pick your brain about this one, but do you only recruit ACNL players? And do you have to be ACNL player to be recruited? Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak to my, uh, my experience at, at the University of West Florida. Um, we, have an F, we had an FKK player, Kendall Bobbitt. Um, she was an ACNL kid and she got recruited and she played a lot for us and she's done very well for us when I was there at West Florida. So that's kind of, uh, kind of the short answer to that question. No, you don't have to um, only be an ECNL player. Um, ECNL is good. It gives you a gauge of, of kind of what to expect on the field, but you know, there are, there are very good clubs that have a second team that could probably beat a lot of those ECNL teams. Um, you, I mean, you, you see it everywhere. So, um, no, it's, it's not, it's not, uh, a necessity to be an ECNL player just to get recruited. I mean, you can look at, um, you know, clubs that have had division one, like power five division one players that aren't on the ECNL that weren't on a DA team. They were just on a regular old club team. Um, it, it's, it gives you a good idea of what to expect, but you know, you, there are good players everywhere and maybe just for some reason, the ECNL coach didn't think that player fit the particular style, but that player could be a brilliant player for a, for a, a college team that needs a, that stylistic uh, character or the, those stylistic tendencies of a player. Uh, might fit in good with a college and they just might not necessarily fit in for that ECNL team. So there's a lot. Um, another thing is, you know, goalkeepers on a club team, you typically see maybe one, maybe two. So when you go down, if you're not the ECNL goalkeeper, but you're still a good goalkeeper, you're still going to get recruited. It's, that's just, that's just the reality of it. If you're a good player, it doesn't matter if you're on the first team or the third team, someone's going to find you. Someone's going to dig deep. Someone's going to go out there and grind and find that player and, and recruit you. So, um, you know, don't, don't just say, oh, I'm, I'm not on the ECNL team. I, you know, I'm done playing because I'm never going to get recruited. No. If, you know, at, at FKK, we were talking earlier. I mean, you've got, this, you've got the second team after ECNL. I mean, they would miss out just on this is a compliment to you, Jimmy, but they'd miss out on, on, on some good coaching as well. So it's, it's like, don't give up because you're not on, on an ECNL team. You if I ended up, if I was a 17 year old girl and I ended up on Jimmy Angelis' team and not the ECNL team, I wouldn't be disappointed at all just no. because of, you know, the, the, the connections you have and the connections the club has and, and this and that don't, don't set your eyes up for, for one, um, for one specific goal. Um, it's, you know, that, that, the ESPN thing where the last dance just came out and it talks about Michael Jordan. We all know his whole thing where his high school coach cut him, blah, blah, blah. And he's, you know, turned out to be one of the best. So, um, again, if you're not on the top quote unquote team, that doesn't mean anything. We're, we're going to find you one way or the other. Aaron, we have a question that came last. Um, I wanted to pick your brain about this. So that we have players that are shying away from JUCO because they feel that um, they will never get to the goal, meaning D2, D1. Um, what is the recruiting process? And do you actually look into JUCOs and to sophomores that are in Ju at a JUCO uh, program to also be recruited in your program? Yeah, absolutely. So JUCO players are actually really attractive to us just because they've already had the experience of playing collegiate soccer. Um, the biggest jump from high school or even club 
soccer to college is just the overall speed of play and athleticism. So with that, you have a year or two under your belt of already playing at a faster speed of play and kind of knowing what to expect in a college program. Um, so we go after a lot of junior college kids really hard. Um, you know, we overall look at our scholarship spreadsheet and we put money specifically aside for hopefully a JUCO transfer every year or at least a transfer. Um, just because they already have um, tactically uh, another two years of experience in addition. So they physically developed a bit more. They've been in a collegiate strength and conditioning program. And overall, um, just that speed of play is massive. Um, I think that's the biggest aspects that you see in a lot of freshman players early on in preseason is adjusting to that speed of play. Um, so JUCO college transfers don't have to do that. And I think that that's a really big um, asset that they have. Yeah, when we talk about stats and when we talk about actually academically, I mean, that's also a big thing for them, you know. Um, we have a couple of kids that were shying away from going the JUCO route because they feel that they will kind of be stagnant and won't be able to move forward. But um, I know and you guys know that the JUCO route is actually one of the best routes, you know, if not the cheapest route. Um, so um, I'm trying. I wanted to make sure that you guys answer that question because it was good. Um, I'm gonna give you that last question. I and I, I swear it, I'll, I'll leave you guys alone because I know you guys want to go back to your families. But um, I wanted to pick your brain about our process, the process that the that, that FKK has found. You guys have been at our our um, events. You have met some of our staff. Um, I'm in communication with you guys consistently with our program. Um, and then you have seen our teams. Um, what do you think we do it right? What do you think we do it wrong? What do you think we should change um, in order for us to uh, make be more successful than what we are? Uh, let's start with you, John. Yeah, come closer to Texas. <laughs> 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 no, I, you know, I would, yeah, again, I mean, from, from, if you look at the whole process, top to bottom, what you guys do, I mean, you guys, you guys have your, your event that you do right in, in, in relation to the ECNL event. So you, you know, you, it's well thought out in the sense that you, you plan to have college coaches already there because they're already going to be there and they're coming from all over the country. I mean, who doesn't want to go to Florida in January? Um, so, you know, you've got that and then you've got, you know, you've always been reaching out in terms of running camps and, and ID clinics and things like that. I mean, those are, those are the things that we like to do because to go and be able to see a, a mass amount of players in one environment and, and even in the sense of a camp, um, you get it to be a little more personal with the players as well because you can, you know, banter with them and, and get to know them a little bit and things like that. So, um, you, you know, what you guys do in that sense and in, in how you're always getting your kids on display is is very very good um you know you guys work hard from you know number one you know not to go back to ranking the teams but you go from number one on the ecnl team to you know number i don't know just make up a number 97 on the fourth team or whatever it is you're working hard for all those kids to find a place for them to play if they want to play um you know it's that's something that says you know a lot to how much you guys want your kids to do well um and that means that you guys are taking your club takes pride in that so i you know i we do appreciate that you know if i was to say um if i was to say where where you guys could get better i mean that's that's tough to 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 really dissect that i mean um yeah i mean you guys you guys i mean you guys just have you guys have the what you need in terms of getting your kids on display. I mean, FKK is a, is a household name in soccer. So um, to say that you're doing something wrong, it would take me quite a while to really try to figure it out. And I'm, I'm certain that I probably wouldn't be able to find much. So, um, I mean, you even bring the best food out for when we're there. So, <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> you know, you, you keep the coaches fed and, and you keep the coaches, you know, happy and, and hydrated and, and, you know, with good players and good soccer in front of us, I mean, there's not much to really complain about. Um, you know, some coaches will complain that, oh, you know, we didn't get to sign that kid. They went to another, they went to another school. That would be a complaint. But 
in reality, that kid got recruited and you guys did your job. So there's not much to say in that sense. So, you know, I, I appreciate what you guys have done and, uh, you know, from you and Mark and you and, and Juan and Tibor and Chris and Jordan, everybody from top to bottom. Um, you know, you guys, you guys do a great job from, from your players to your goalkeepers. So, um, you know, if we weren't happy, if I wasn't happy with what you guys did, I probably wouldn't be on this call. Right. So, True. um, yeah, I mean, we appreciate you guys and we, we want to try to get more of you, your players over here in Texas. I, I know Q's got a little tie to Texas, so I think he can start nudging some this way for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure about that. Aaron, I know we have a good relationship as well. I would like to hear your opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I thought, you know, John answered the question very well. Um, so to kind of echo what he said, um, I think your communication is fantastic. Um, every time that we're in Florida, you know, we definitely want to see an FKK team play. Or if you guys are at a recruiting event, we make sure to to come out and see you. Um, but I think your events are fantastic. Um, the marketing, promotion, overall communication of them are all all spot on, um, and the timeliness of them too. Just very convenient. You know, we're already there and. Um, the time slots that you guys give are, are perfect. Um, similar to John in, in areas of improvement, you know, kind of on the slimmer ends there. Um, I would love for more of your kids to reach out prior to the event. Um, would be, be awesome um, just to get more on our radar. Um, and obviously you can encourage them as much as you can. And at the end of the day, you can only lead the horse to water so much. Um, but, you know, we'd love to see more kids continue to reach out prior to the event um, so that we can just make sure that we do get to see them over those, those several days. Um, but, yeah, I think you guys are doing great, and we appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much, guys, for your time. I appreciate all the efforts to be with us in this call. Um, I know that, you know, you guys are spending some time with family now that you can, and um, I appreciate everything you guys have done for us. I know I have worked with both of you. and. I, I cannot think uh, better than from both, and I wish you guys well. I know, John, you, it's your first season, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed and praying for you guys to, to have a good season. And Aaron, I know you guys are working very hard to uh, turn the program around and, and continue to be successful. So I thank you guys very much. We'll continue the communication. For you guys that are watching, thanks again for watching us. Um, continue to be safe and um, stay healthy. All right, we'll catch up on the next one. Thank you very much.